Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Thank each and every last one of you that has supported this channel. We are almost at our 15,000 subscriber mark, and I could not be happier. If you are new here or already have been here, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. It does help this channel out, and it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled, Disturbing Ouija Board Experiences. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I was at a sleepover with my friend Anne. We were doing normal sleepover stuff, like playing games and watching Netflix. We soon got bored and Anne remembered about something she found in her basement just recently. It was an old Ouija board and wooden like in the movies. She decided to play with it, but I hesitated. I had a feeling this would not turn out well, but we started playing anyway. I convinced myself that it would be fun. We started out asking basic questions like, who would I marry and how many countries would I visit? Soon, things got worse. I went to the kitchen to grab some soda and pretzels to eat. When I came back, Anne's face looked terrified. While I was gone, she had asked the Ouija board when she would die. It replied and said, Tomorrow, 3.45 p.m. I was absolutely scared out of my mind. 3.45 was when school ended, when she was normally picked up by her parents. I prayed that night for her to be okay, but my prayers weren't enough. I got a call back from my mom later the next day, saying that Anne was in a car accident with a semi-truck, and her parents were okay, but she did not survive. I will never forget that experience, and I warn you to never play with a Ouija board or you will lose your best friend like I did. This is a very true story. Okay, so I have to tell a story that my mom told me a while back. It was her experience with a Ouija board, and my mom wouldn't make something up like this. The whole reason she even told me about it was because I brought up the idea of using one to contact a younger brother who had passed away. Anyway, her story freaked me out enough to never, ever use one. Back when she was in high school, late one night, her and a group of her friends were cruising around on gravel roads a few miles outside of town. I live in a small town in Iowa and they stopped at an old abandoned barn and decided to whip out an old Ouija board. One of her friends just happened to have on her. My mom had a really bad feeling right off the bat and said she wasn't going to do it. Well, everyone kept calling her a sissy and saying it won't work unless everyone who was there plays. So my mother was convinced, but under one condition. She'd play if they didn't ask sketchy questions. Some of the guys laughed it off and made the promise not to. So they all gathered around the floor of the barn and placed their hands on the planchette of the board. They asked some basic questions about, is there anyone here? What is your name? Things like that. Of course, no response. Then a guy named Terry asked, which one of us will be the first one to die? and my mom pulled her hands off of the board and said, that's not funny. She was super pissed, and everyone screamed at her to put her hands back on the board. As soon as she put her hands back on, the piece moved and spelled out the initials of a boy who was there. CJ. I can't remember his last name. And he was a twin. His twin was also present, and not that it matters. 
after they said goodbye because they were all freaked out and my mom was pissed and everyone was blaming each other for moving the planchette across the board. So anyway, they all went home and basically forgot about the entire thing. Years later, that CJ fella was out driving on a gravel road when he ended up crashing into a ditch and dying. The first one out of everyone there, and the creepy thing is that when the police were done investigating the crash, they said the tire flew off because someone purposefully loosened the lug nuts on the tire. So ever since she told me that story, I've been way too scared to even come close and try to use the Ouija board. So, before I explain the story, I just want to set a few things straight. I had this friend who was a twin. They had a younger sister, too, but that is irrelevant. Shortly after the twins were born, the mom had a stillbirth, and it caused her a massive amount of stress. My friend would tell me that he remembers when he was younger. He would wake up to his mom in the other room, talking to the empty crib, she would have conversations at strange hours of the night, but apparently this kind of behavior is pretty normal, given the circumstances. It messed her up pretty bad, and later on, she started telling everyone she was a medium-type thing. She claimed that she had a sixth sense and was sensitive to afterlife phenomena. The older the twins got, she started to calm down a bit with a strange behavior, but she still believed she had a gift. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, I can tell you the creepy experience that happened to me when I was at their house during a boys' night. It was the twins' birthday, and the one I was friends with managed to convince his mom to invite a small handful of friends over. His mom made plans to go out that night with her new partner, which was great because we always got up to no good and without supervision. This was the perfect opportunity to get up to some mischief. His mom finally just left us alone. After an hour or so, we were running out of things to do. I don't know why, but I suggested that we try the Ouija board. I've seen them in the movies and I thought it would be hilarious if we tried it out ourselves. All the boys agreed, and I got to work setting up the table outside. I cut out letters along with a yes and no. I placed them in a circle on a plastic table and put one of his mom's shot glasses in the middle. I explained the rules to the guys and were all extremely excited to basically give it a go. The other twin was tired, though. He said he was going to have a shower and call it an early night. He also didn't like the idea of us doing this sort of thing, but we continued to do so anyways, despite his concern. We decided we would set up a tripod camera to overlook the table, just in case anything supernatural were to happen. We turned it on and started to record. At this point, we were all sitting around the table. We placed our fingers on the shot glass and started firing questions into a circle. We were asking stupid, immature questions like, Are you gay? Or can we speak to Elvis? Etc. Nothing seemed to happen, but we were all laughing and carrying on. Then the glass started to move, but we could tell straight away it was someone on the table. You could tell by the way the glass was moving. It was obvious and annoying because I really wanted it to work. We started to get restless were on the verge of giving up on the whole thing because people were being stupid and no one was giving it a fair chance. The next bet is where things got weird. The air became cold and the breeze died down. I remember that chilling feeling shivering outside in the cold. My eyes started to water and I felt hypersensitive. I'm pretty sure the other guys felt it too. That's when it happened. The glass started to move randomly. It felt completely different this time. 
It wasn't being pushed, if that makes sense. It was kind of dragging our fingers along the table. The movement was slow and eerie. At this point, we all look up at each other, darting from base to base, trying to figure out who was messing around this time. Every single face around the circle looked terrified and confused. The glass moved from letter to letter, not spelling words, but only gibberish. I hated the feeling, but I needed to know more. I started to ask questions this time. Who are you? Still, nothing. The glass was just moving around with no purpose. Then it would stop as if it disconnected. Then it would start up again. It would get weak, then fade back in with the movement. Are you a person? I ask. The glass moved to the center, then back down to no. This is the moment where I knew this was a bad idea. The glass started to pick up speed. It was moving around in circles, completely ignoring the letters. Its movements became fast and aggressive. It felt as if it was being pushed into the table really hard. Everyone was horrified. A few guys even took their fingers off of the shot glass in shock. The remainder of us decided to push on out of curiosity. Are you dead? Another person asked. The glass slowly slid over to yes. Then, all of a sudden, the lights and all of the power to the house turned off. We were all sitting in pitch black darkness outside with sudden silence. We shot up and broke away from the table. There was a sense of panic in the air. Then we all started to completely freak out when the power surged it back on and the TV started up again. The other twin ran outside, still wet from the shower, only wearing a towel. He came out asking who turned the bathroom lights off while he was in there. We explained the situation outside with the Ouija board, and he refused to believe it. Then I thought, yes. We recorded it with a camera. We ran over to the tripod and grabbed the camera to show him the evidence. The camera was turned off, and we were all dumbfounded because it had full battery when we started, and we were positive we pressed record. We slowly turned it back on. Yes, the battery bar was just about full, like I thought. We pressed play, but me, being the amateur that I am, I'd recorded it on an awkward angle. You couldn't see the table, but just the back of our heads. As it played out, we got to the start just before the power to the house turned off. And then, so did the camera footage. The video literally just stopped. Somehow the camera turned off at the exact time the house power went out. The weird thing was the camera was on a battery and had nothing to do with the house power. The mood of the night was ruined. No one was happy or excited. We were all just quiet. Everyone was trying to process what had just happened. Even the twin who was in the shower was confused and creeped out. We asked him if he was the one who messed around with the power inside, and he swore he hadn't. I believe him to this day. I never messed around with a Ouija board after that chilling experience. What started off as a joke became weird really fast. I just want to know if anybody else has had a similar story or experience. This happened years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. My eyes are watering as I'm writing this right now. Now that I'm older, I'm thinking about trying it one last time. This weekend with a good friend, mind you. I'm hoping for a similar reaction now that I'm more mature, I'm sure I can hold it together this time and understand it a bit better. I don't know what to think, but yeah, that's my story. Thank you for listening. So, I've always been somewhat keen to the supernatural. I definitely opened up a door when I was 18 and used a Ouija board. 
We were all in the backyard of my friend's house. There were about five of us, and one of our friends had the glow-in-the-dark board. I was terrified, but intrigued. My mother is extremely religious and had always forbode me to use one. So we sat there for a few minutes asking stupid questions and not really getting any answers. But it was a couple minutes later when I could feel it. Something was there. My hands started to shake like crazy, and of course my friends started to make fun of me. But they didn't know what was going on. I started to hear a deep male's breathing in my ear. I tried to tell myself it was my friend Megan who was sitting next to me. But she was not close enough, nor was she breathing that hard. In my head, I just said, go away, go away, go away. And it eventually did. I can't explain it to this day, but it was weird because as it was happening, I didn't tell anyone. I was just sitting there freaking out. As we were all heading back home, I begged my friend Megan to sleep over because I knew whatever had breathed into my ear was going to follow me back. I asked Megan if she had heard any noises herself, and she was like, what the hell? No. And basically thought I was making it up. For the next month, I kid you not, my house was haunted. I could not sleep without the lights on and music in my ears. I would hear footsteps every night outside my door and periodically would wake up at 3 a.m. After a month passed, my mother sat me down. Ashley, what the hell is going on? I did not tell her at all about using the board because I knew she would be furious. Um, nothing, Mom. Nothing at all. Ashley, you tell me what's going on. For the last month, I've been hearing footsteps, and last night, something scratched my foot. I just looked at her dumbfounded, because I thought this was only affecting me. I basically broke down crying and told her everything. Together, we saged the house and said prayers. And it's amazing how different the house felt. It felt lighter and pleasant again. Since then, I've been prominently more aware of ghosts. They usually come to me in my dreams, though. If you've ever wondered if Ouija boards work, they do. It might not seem like it's working, but you're literally opening a door. And they won't necessarily make themselves known on the board. Oh yeah, I forgot. And it turns out some guy had killed himself at the house where we used the Ouija board. Okay, so before I begin, I'd like to explain that the story I'm going to post is quite controversial. I've posted it elsewhere, but some people believe me and some say I made it up. I don't ask that you believe, I just tell the story to mainly make people aware that Ouija boards should be taken very seriously. Make sure you look up proper procedures and how to use it before playing it with anyone. So I'd like to begin with this story I've tried to forget, and I can't remember every single detail. I can't remember every one of the questions we asked and the answers we received. I can remember a few, but I 100% remember what happened with me. In this story, my brother Nick, my sister-in-law Brittany, her friend Ashley, and my girlfriend at the time, Katie, and with that, let's begin. I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2010. This year, I had a rush of getting into the paranormal. The fact that ghosts and demons are real fascinated me and would make my adrenaline pump when I would encounter such things. Well, this particular night, my sister-in-law had asked me if I had taken part in a Ouija board. And at the time, I had no clue what that even was. 
so she knew obviously I never did. So she began explaining what Ouija boards are, how they work, and such. Then she asked me if I would like to experience it for myself. Of course, just at the thought, my heart had skipped a beat. So we decided that we would do it and had to find a place to do it. Her parents wouldn't let us do it in their house. My brother and her were only dating at this time, let alone even around their house. So me and my brother decided, screw it. I know mom and dad won't let us do it inside, but outside on the porch or in the garage shouldn't be a big deal, right? So we go down to my parents' house and we start setting up shop on the back porch. Got a candle, matches, pen and paper, grab some chairs around a table and set ourselves around it. Just as we were starting, my heart started pumping so fast and hard, I was really nervous. Was this going to work, I wondered. So we all put our hands over the Ouija and Brittany had one hand over it so she could write with the other, and she started by asking if there are any friendly spirits around us that would like to communicate with us. The planchette moved to no, and I started freaking out. I'm only barely touching this fucking thing, and I mean my fingers are pretty much hovering over it, with a paper-thin gap away from the planchette. Triangular-shaped piece, usually with a small glass circle in the center used to cast over letters and such to communicate with us. I asked if anybody was moving it and told them to stop fucking with me. I ain't got time for bullshit. And everyone was saying, no, we're not playing around with you. We want this to work just as bad as you are. And Brittany asked Nick to be serious. Are you playing around? And to stop it. If so, he said he wasn't. He wanted it to work, too. So, then Brittany's voice became firm, and she stated that only benevolent entities are welcomed here, and any violent entities were not welcome to speak with us, and that they could go ahead and leave, or we'll just end the session. So, we waited a few minutes, all placed our hands over the planchette again, and Brittany states again, are there any spirits here with us tonight that would like to communicate with all of us? The planchette slowly moved to yes. So sure, maybe an entity was lying to us. Who knows, right? But we decided to keep going to try to communicate with the spirit. Brittany asks, is there anybody particular here that you would like to speak with? The board then pretty swiftly moved to yes, and then back to the center. Now, usually you are the ones that would push the planchette back to the center, but this spirit just seemed to guide it the whole time we were communicating with it. Brittany begins to ask it who it would like to communicate with first. The board slowly spelt out Ashley's name. Now, Ashley began getting nervous, asking me why. Why does it want to start with me? She seemed to be getting nervous, and shit, I would too if I had specified wanting to communicate with me first. So, Brittany tells Ashley to ask it something that the spirit might know, like an old relative or something. She wanted to test out if it were a demon lying, so they asked the question, that only a relative would know. Not something that could be an easy guesser. And Ashley asked what year the spirit had died, if it had even ever lived. I can't remember the year it spelled out, but I do remember her exclaiming that that was the year her mother had died. And she began getting frantic and sad, but she was still interested. So Brittany told her, to ask questions only her mother would know. I can't remember all of these, but Ashley asked personal questions only her mom would know. Not even any of us would have known these things. That's when things started to get creepy. So here's Ashley becoming very emotional, believing she is really speaking with her mother at one point. 
One of us would take our finger off and see if it would go with just three of us, then two of us, then Ashley herself. And then Planchette would still slightly move around with just Ashley hovering two fingers above the piece. Whoever it was had a strong connection with her. I remember the spirit spelling out how thankful it was Ashley found my sister-in-law that her mother never left her side and was just happy she had a real friend in her life that truly cared for her daughter. All of this had happened, and I mean we spent a good time over an hour, maybe even more than two hours, communicating for Ashley, and Ashley felt she had asked enough. We asked that her mother's spirit stay with us and asked if there was any other family spirits around that would like to communicate with us. And if so, if it would watch over. Well, the board went to yes and no. We asked what it meant, and it slowly spelled out evil and good, and that the good fought evil away. We thanked her mother and the other spirits for protecting us and asked her mother if she would communicate for us with the others. The planchette went to yes. So we all began taking turns, my brother, then Katie, just asking random questions. My brother being stupid and asking how he could die, and I forget what the board said. I think it had said age, assuming it was a saying old age, and he said, that shit's lame. And the girls all gave him shit because I guess you're not supposed to ask questions like that. There's some things you shouldn't ask because you shouldn't know. You should just let things play out. Well, it gets to my turn, and I couldn't really think of much. I knew I was thinking around, asking if I was going to die like my younger brother had asked, just to piss off the girls, but to be honest when I was younger. I never thought I was going to make it past 18. I just felt like I was here for a good time, not a long time. Still kind of feel that way, but obviously I made it past 18. Well, actually, I barely did. Anyway, I asked if my grandfather was okay and if he made it to heaven. I got yes and a proud response. Then I asked it if I was going to be a successful football player. That year, I had just received offers to go play for the Miami Hurricanes and Ole Miss, and I wanted to know if I could go pro. The board said yes. I got excited, but... Hence I ask it if I could not. If I would then, I ask what offer I should take. What would be the best, you know, for me? It said, Miss. I got excited because that was the school that I was going to, but I also felt like maybe these were easy answers because they can read what I want, and that's how it's answering now. Who knows if we were still communicating with Ashley's mom? So I guessed it if I would make it to Ole Miss. The board said no. I got hurt. That shit fucked me up. I asked it why. It slowly spelt out, accident. I said, what accident? What accident am I going to be hurt in? It said, yes. Now everybody was getting nervous, but I was getting pissed, and Brittany reminded me that I was asking questions that you should not ask. But now I was invested. To hell with it. I wanted to know. It slowly spelled out, car, and death. Well, at this point, Brittany had enough. I was asking questions I shouldn't be, so had my brother. She didn't like the feelings she was receiving anymore from the energy in the room and she decided to begin ending the session. Well, that's just what she said. Well, now, we'll shortly just get to why I tell this story to warn people about Ouija's. A year and a half later, so 2011, in my junior year, I got a job at a pizza place delivering pizzas after football season to help my parents out by paying my own cell phone, gas, and such just helping them out if they needed it. Well, one night, a night that I, too, to this day, 
cannot remember. I only remember what I was told. I got into a really bad car accident while at work one night. Apparently, from what eyewitnesses had told police, what the doctors and police told me the next morning, when I finally gained consciousness at around 7 to 8 a.m., I was coming around a corner on US-1. It's an old highway down here in Florida. With a bit of traffic following me on the other end were two cars parked side by side in the median. One of the vehicles, well, the one that I hit, was parked in the median, but the majority was out in the road on the highway. So here came me in a bunch of traffic with nowhere to go. I slammed into this lady's back end of her trailblazer at about 75 miles per hour. I don't wear seatbelts, so I bounced the fuck around inside hitting my windshield and blowing out my driver window with my face. And I hit so hard that our cars bounced apart, and my vehicle almost went off the edge into the water, which is a big river next to the highway. The front end of my vehicle was crushed all the way to my windshield. There was nothing left, really. Sorry, I said I'd keep this story short. I got a grade three concussion. Contusion on my forehead. The size of a cantaloupe, maybe bigger. Tore my meniscus, broke my leg and such. I stayed in the ICU for two weeks. Didn't get to go back to school that year, but was on hospital homebound because I got so messed up I could barely walk from torn muscles and fractures in my leg. I was having seizures and doctors were afraid of me bumping my head, saying I could easily die, so I stayed in a wheelchair for a few months at home. So yeah, I never got to play football again. I lost my scholarship and couldn't help but to think, for the love of God, did this happen to me because I had asked the Ouija board this and it said this would happen? Even if I never did ask, would it have? As a long story short, either way, fuck around with Ouija's or be very careful out there if you do, guys. An experience with a Ouija board, which, despite being very skeptical, I can't fully explain away. Apologies for this long story, but here it goes. Years ago, myself, my best friend, another friend, and three girls were at one of the girls' houses for Halloween. We were just going to spend the afternoon and evening chilling and watching horror movies. Anyway, during the afternoon, the girl whose house it was says she has a Ouija board and she would love to play with that. All three girls really excited to do it, best friend kind of superstitious, and very reluctant. Myself and another friend were kind of skeptical and indifferent to doing it, but deemed it pointless. Even more so when she brought it out and it was some shitty thing she'd made herself with a bit of old wood and a marker pen and one of her dad's whiskey glasses as a planchette. But we were horny teens, and the girls had boobs, so inevitably they got their way. Superstitious friend still wants no part. But the other five of us start playing. The grimly predictable happens, and it starts spelling things out like show boobs. Almost as if one of the guys were forcing the glass when we had our fingers on it. Me and the other guy found this hilarious. Girls just got annoyed. We weren't taking it seriously. So we all agreed to do it properly. After a bit of random twitching, it starts going. Five. No. Six. Yes. Repeatedly. We took this to mean it wanted the guy who wasn't joining in to join. Note here. Everyone said at the time and afterwards that they weren't forcing it now. The rational part of me assumes they were, but I'm not sure. 
After much persuasion, the third guy joins us. Again, there is a period of a few random letters or twitching, but nothing coherent. Then it starts, repeating a sequence of three numbers and letters, over and over again. Suddenly, the guy that joined us last jumps back. Out of instinct, we all do the same. The glass falls over, and it is all steamed up with a cross scratched on the inside. Girls kind of freaked out. I guess the glass obviously steamed up because we just spent however long with six sweaty teenage hands on a cold upturned glass. It's called condensation and is far from supernatural. The cross was probably a pre-existing flaw in the glass. Dishwasher scratches or something. That we didn't notice before, but became more apparent when the glass had steamed up. Note here, I'm still convinced I was right on this fact, and it is unrelated to any spookiness, but adding it in for completeness of the story. Anyway, guy three is now very quiet, definitely not playing again, so we stick a movie on instead. Shortly after, he goes home, clearly not his usual self. The next day, he calls me and asks if I'll go somewhere with him. We get a train a few towns over, and he explains on the way. I knew prior to any of this, his dad had run out on him, and his mom when he was a baby. And he had no contact with that side of the family, knowing only who they were from photo albums. On the journey, he fills me in and all the gaps. His surname is obviously his dad's. His parents were married, now divorced. He never changed it to his mom's name. His middle name was a family tradition on his dad's side. And he had an uncle who died in a motorcycle crash a few weeks before he was born. He knew nothing but his first name and about the accident from going through photos with his mom. Oh, that your uncle whatever, he died, just before you were born, or whatever. Anyway, the three letters were his uncle's initials. It took him a while of them repeating to click, but obviously at some point, the sequence containing two of his three initials registered. Then it hit him. The third one was his uncle's first name initial. He'd ask his mom about it when he got home, but she had little to add. He didn't already know, and we were now on the train on our way to the cemetery his uncle was buried in, so we could see if he could make any sense of the numbers. His mom knew of the cemetery from the funeral, but since the divorce, hadn't been there since. He had never been there before. Note, at this point, the steam and the cross and the bits everyone else found spookiest, I was sure were as per my explanation and maintain this stance to this day, despite of the next bit. I was now thinking maybe everyone else was in on it. Maybe he'd been more curious about his dad's side of the family now that he was older, had visited the grave recently, and they all conspired to try and scare me. One of it, not all the way, others forcing the five, no, six, yes bit. Him reluctantly joining in, the stem cross still as per my explanation, and just a fortunate coincidence. And now we were on our way to some pre-planned big reveal at the graveyard, which would be in their plan to scare my pants off. So, we went to the graveyard, wander around for ages trying to find the grave. Eventually we found it, and the mysterious string of numbers that followed the three letters were the chapter and verse of two biblical inscriptions on the two headstones. I have to admit that, were I not already onto their little scheme that would have been pretty clever, I turned to my friend to high-five him and compliment him on what would have been a very clever ruse had I not figured it out. To see him just sitting on the grass, staring at the grave, 
then started sobbing. Literally just sat there with tears streaming down his cheeks. Now, this guy can lie and he can prank, but my rationalization of everything anyone claims to be supernatural would make me the gold standard target for a spooky Halloween prank. But he can't act. He was obviously and genuinely fucking sad. I just went and sat by him. We sat there for ages, then just went home and pretty much silent. This was mid-90s. He's still my best friend. Randomly, over the years, I pestered him to do another Ouija board with me, as I'm curious now, and he is the only one I've had anything vaguely resembling a result from. He always declines. He won't talk about what happened, not as in silent treatment, but just changes the subject. However, not long after that event, he did start to track down that side of his family, as reconciled with his father, and met with his brothers, etc. I collect Ouija boards. I know how strange this sounds. Most people collect stamps, coins, vinyl posters, and the like. I should probably preface this by saying I have pretty extensive knowledge of the paranormal. I have been having experiences with it since I was a child. This led me to delve into the world of paranormal investigation in my teens and early 20s, which coincided with my beginning to collect the board. Since then, I have amassed quite a collection but there is one that I refuse to even keep in my house. I call it the Salem board. I used to do special FX makeup for films and I was in Salem, Massachusetts for a job. As you have probably gathered, I'm a lover of the strange, unusual, and all things creepy. So I was thrilled by this opportunity. I'd gotten into town a few days before filming began, so I could prep, but also I could do a little sightseeing. I was wandering through some of the shops and happened to walk into one that had a pretty large collection of Ouija boards. Some were vintage, some were etched glass, and some were burnt wood. At the back of the shop, there was a locked display case, which immediately caught my eye. Alone at the top shelf was a board that looked as though it was the cross section of a tree stump. It had the usual markings of a Ouija board, but they looked to be hand carved into the wood. It was also covered in runes. I went to the guy behind the counter and asked how much it was. It's not for sale, he said quietly. Why not? I asked. He looked back at the cabinet and then back at me. That board is made from a tree that was used to hang witches during the Salem witch trials. I looked at him skeptically. That was a pretty tall claim. I really did want the board, though. It would look great in my collection and be a cool conversation piece. Are you sure you don't want to sell it? Once again, he looked between me and the cabinet. 150. Cash. No returns. I handed him the money, and he walked to the cabinet to unlock it. He must have noticed the confused look on my face when he handed me the board. It doesn't come with the planchette. This board was not exactly meant to be used. I wasn't exactly sure how to respond to that, so I just said thanks and left the shop. Fast forward a few months, I am back home in Seattle, in my one-bedroom apartment where I lived alone. I had put the Salem board in a box in my closet, since I was waiting on a new display case, and didn't really have anywhere else to put it. My closet had two sliding doors and a shelf on top of the bar where you could hang your clothes. 
The shelf was actually pretty large, so it accommodated the box with room to spare. I had gone to bed that night and fell asleep with the TV on. I was awoken around 3 a.m. by the sound of something hitting my closet door. I decided to make sure my ball python, Kronos, was in his cage, since every now and again he got out. He would try and get into my closet where the hot water heater is. I saw he was curled up under his log and cautiously opened the closet door to see the box had fallen off the shelf and was now resting against the door. I was puzzled at this, but thought in my sleepiness that I had just not pushed it back far enough. I pushed the box back and went back to sleep. About 30 minutes later, I heard another noise from my closet, but this time it was much louder. When I opened my eyes, I could see that one of my closet doors had been pushed outwards. The box had fallen off the shelf again, but this time had done it with so much force it had wedged between my clothes and the door. At this point, I was becoming a bit concerned. Instead of putting the box back on the shelf, I placed it on the floor of my closet and shut the door. When I woke up in the morning, I turned over to grab my phone off the nightstand and saw my closet door wide open. The box had been pushed out into the middle of the room. At this point, I became concerned. This was an object with a lot of emotion attached to it. A lot of anger and a lot of pain and suffering. I thought it best to keep in a box and put the box in my storage unit. A few years go by and my mom keeps bugging me to clean out some things from the unit since she needed some space for her stuff. It was in the middle of summer and the storage unit was sweltering. I was going through boxes, aimlessly tossing things into piles, when I came across the box. The room was suddenly freezing. I took the lid off and looked down. The Salem board was sitting on top of several other Ouija boards I had acquired over the years. They had all been cracked in half right down the middle. All of them. Except, of course, for the Salem board. I stared into the box trying to comprehend what I was looking at. These boards looked like someone had broken them over their knee. Surely not the result of a box being dropped or jostled. I removed the board from the box and placed it in a wooden chest I had acquired from my great-grandmother, who had considered herself to be a witch. It remains in that box to this day. I believe there are forces in this world that we never understand. I am sure you are wondering why I didn't get rid of the board. In a way, I feel tied to it. It called to me and I answered. I consider myself its keeper. As long as it is with me, everyone else is safe from whoever or whatever is attached to it. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, disturbing Ouija board experiences. I do apologize for the 15 minutes of shortness, but I wanted to make sure that you got all fresh stories instead of those having been repeated. And don't worry, I have something very special ahead for the weekend. I'd like to take a moment and give a special thank you to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Enerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank each of you for your continued support of Back to Ashes. I really do appreciate you more than I can put into words. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.